This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Matthew May about how to achieve breakthrough innovation. And we'll also speak with Mike Micklewright about lean improvements and the business management system. That and more when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for February 28th, 2014. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Uh, this risk assessment story that we're going to cover right now is from Booz & Company, and we picked this out uh, because it is a good example of the use of risk analysis, something that we talk about quite a bit on the show. Partic uh, risk analysis is actually a hot topic for the last five or six years or so. So according to, uh, to Booz & Company, a U.S. regulated utility is planning an $8 billion nuclear power plant construction to satisfy the growing load demand towards the end of this decade. Uh, it is pursuing a Department of Energy federal loan guarantee to facilitate financing. But, says Booz, given the evolving licensing process, the engineering procurement and construction, industry's lack of recent experience constructing nuclear power plants, first-of-a-kind technologies, the new licensing process, and macroeconomic uncertainty, the utility sought a comprehensive project uh, risk assessment to understand how exposure to project-specific and external risks could adversely affect project outcomes. So, risk analysis. Hot topic, as I said, in the last five years or so, and typically when we think of risk analysis or we look at risk, typically when we talk about it on this show, it's within an existing venture. You have a company, you have a product or a service, and you want to kind of analyze what would happen if there was a supply chain disruption, what would happen if, if our product caused some sort of harm or some, so, something. So typically within the construct of an existing company. Yeah, you have a baseline. You have a baseline yep, you have already, a so you, you're trying to understand how some risk may affect that baseline for, for, for ill. Exactly. So this is a, a slightly different example of risk analysis, which was something that was uh, why, why it caught our attention. This company is trying to analyze risk before even getting into a project. And this particular project, as you can imagine, nuclear project, uh, has a lot of risk elements that need to be looked at. So to help with the analysis, Booz and Company helped the company with the following risk analysis steps, which really can apply to any risk analysis project, and we thought they were just kind of worthwhile going through here. Uh, number one, identify potential risks and uncertainties expected to adversely impact cost or schedule associated with the project planning, uh, construction, and testing. So first of all, what are your risks? Then, after you've identified your risks, es estimate their likelihood of occurrence and cost and schedule impact. So again, we've seen these kind of uh, things where you have, uh, you know, what is the uh, uh, likelihood that this bad event could occur, and if it does occur, what is the impact? Booz added an extra step, which we thought was pretty cool, is they incorporated the likelihood and cost e estimates into a customized Monte Carlo simulation uh, uh, in order to kind of uh, take a look at this within a simulation point of view. The project, uh, number three, project project, I should say, a likely risk-adjusted range of project outcomes to identify the most influential risks, and finally, determine your target risk mitigation strategy. So this is your basically kind of your standard four-step risk assessment, risk analysis process. But I, again, what we thought was interesting is this was done ahead of time to even you know kind of determine what's going to happen once we, uh, assuming we get this contract. Yeah, and I think I think Fukushima has, has become kind of the card-carrying example of, of risk. Yeah, there you so, go. So certainly anybody walking into potentially building a nuclear facility is going to want to understand risk. And, and uh, benchmarking probably is a big part of this too, I would imagine. Sure. Looking at systems that Fukushima had in place and other <laughs> other places I, and, and try to understand how to maybe I, mitigate that. I'm sure they're looking at Fukushima yeah, 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 <laughs> pretty hard. Very, very yeah. closely, no doubt about it. All right, thanks, Dirk. Another interesting story we ran this week comes to us from Mark Rosenthal. His piece, Toyota Kata A3 Problem Solving, ran in Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. You can see it right there. Now, to start with, let, let's, let's give you a couple of definitions. Uh, A3 refers to a standard paper size, in this case, 11 inches 
by 17 inches, a standard A3 piece of paper. Kata is a Japanese term that means form in the sense of structure and just basically underlying forms, things that build the build on. Yeah, and you forward. hear about kata a lot of times if, if you're martial arts or something. Sure. Kata is the, the figures, the, the, the yep. re, 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 repetitive yep. exercises you go through in order to ingrain something in there, your... There was, there was actually an example of that in the video from uh, the Karate on, Kid. Wax on, wax on. Yeah. on. It's, it's really what it's talking about right. there with kata. Yeah. So if you put them together, the A3 and the kata, you, you get a methodology that's intended to solve problems as well as train employees in critical thinking. The 11 by 17 sheet is folded and information about a specific proposal, problem, or project is selectively placed on the paper. And the story literally unfolds as along with the paper as elements of the plan do checked act, act cycle uh, are addressed in this way. For example, through stating the current situation, uh, assigning targets and goals, finding causes and underlying countermeasures, implementing actions, and following up. But more important than the actual issues raised and solutions discovered through the A3 is the discipline, the form, the, the, the kata of the process. For the learner, the A3 is an opportunity to demonstrate to the mentor a commitment to analytical thought. It facilitates and systematizes communications and, as you mentioned, Dirk, it, it happens within martial arts and music, painting, gardening, pretty much any other activity. These very basic building blocks of form are the edifice on which an active, problem-solving culture may flourish. But of course, as Rosenthal points out in this excellent article, there are no shortcuts. Kata demands commitment and patience to deliver results. And to me, I found this fascinating, and he talks uh, in his article as well about examples of this gone wrong, where people try to adapt this kind of word for word into a system that maybe isn't ready for it. There's an underlying culture here that Toyota really had in place which made this work. And the mentor-learner relationship is really key. Um, it's another one of these things that you can look at as a tool, but the underlying principle is really what's important. This idea that you're going to, through the, through, the, through the A3 and through this understanding of kata, you're going to help a mentor, a mentor is going to help a learner understand how to look at a situation think about it critically, piece by piece as it unfolds, right. and be able to address it. It's a really interesting little tool. Well, yeah, it is an interesting tool, but, and I, I think, I, I'm not sure whether you mentioned this, the idea behind it is that you're constrained by the, by paper. This, by the piece that's of right. paper. That's right, that's yeah. so right. You have to be brief and you have to be able to, to use that to explain what's going on. Again, it's an interesting tool, but it really gets to a much more interesting uh, philosophy uh, that underlies it all, an interesting principle. So check that one out. For more information on this item, and in fact, all the pieces that Dirk and I are going to be covering on today's show, just click on the story links right below the video screen. Again, always right down there. Right. Okay. Innovation. It's a word we hear a lot. Sure. We hear about innovative people, innovative companies. We read articles about how to foster innovation or be innovative. Great. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is it? <laughs> what do we mean by innovation? Well, our next guest has a deep passion for ideas, what he calls the lifeblood of innovation and the main event of the imagination. But not just any ideas, only ideas that solve a difficult problem in an elegant way. He defines an elegant solution as one that is both uncommonly simple and surprisingly powerful. And that achieves the maximum effect with minimum means. Matthew E. May is an innovative crusader and the founder of Edit Innovation. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Elegant Solution, Toyota's Formula for Mastering Innovation. His latest book is The Laws of Subtraction. Matt, thanks for being on the show this morning. Thank you. It's good to be here. And, uh, you know, I have a background at Toyota, so I was uh, enjoying your talk of, uh, of A3s, and I bet you don't know why the A3 came about in the first place. I would love to know. Tell Actually, tell us. Give us a story. Uh, back in the day when um, the best way to communicate, the, the fastest way to communicate um, was through fax. That was the biggest sheet of paper that would fit through a fax machine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> excellent. Okay. All right. All right. Well, so Matt, um, just before we get kind of in depth into this, what is innovation? What is your definition of innovation? Uh, well, you know, my definition of innovation, and there, gosh, there are thousands of them, some very, very complex, uh, some pages long. Um, mine I borrowed um, and actually stole, I think it's, I'm going to keep it, uh, from David Newman, who uh, uh, is the founder of JetBlue. And uh, he says this, uh, innovation is trying to figure out, figuring out 
a better way to do something, something better, a way to do something better than it's ever been done before. I think one of the big problems that uh, companies and people have is that when we hear the word innovation, we think of, uh, of iPhones and iPads and gadgets and gizmos, and that's innovation. It's synonymous with technology, and that sort of excludes uh, the everyman from from the act of innovation. So it's a simple definition. Gets rid of, of the, the the silly arguments around is this incremental innovation? Is it radical disruptive innovation? Because at the end of the day, innovation really is about figuring out a way to do something better than it's ever been done before. Well, let me ask you this. And and when I think of innovation, I think of it's kind of the way you wired. I mean, you've got an engineering mind or you've got, a, you know, an artist mind or you're, you're, you're geared towards management. I mean, to me, innovation is just something, you're an innovative person or you aren't. So I, kind of what I've gotten from your readings and so forth is that it can be taught. How is that? Well, I, I think what you're talking about really are styles of innovation. Um, more so than innovation or not. And perhaps they're better characterized as creative styles. Some of us are very innovative in an engineering way. Some of us are very innovative in a diplomatic sort of way. Some of us are very innovative in a, in a, in a task orientation. Um, but I believe that we come into the world hardwired uh, to, to create new knowledge. Uh, all you have to do is look at a child in a, in a in a sandbox or in a high chair trying to figure out uh, cause and effect by throwing her food on the floor and, and, and watching her learn and make the connections uh, or catch yourself cleaning out your garage the next time and by the time you're done you've come up you've come up with a new and innovative way to cover that you've, your own system really of, of covering that ground so um, I do believe that innovation is something we come into the world with and by and large uh, when we get into the school system it, it gets slowly diluted, um, and the notion of chasing down answers to questions that we come up with is supplanted by chasing down the right answer for a specific que question provided by the teacher. And that, you know, carries over into the work world, and all of a sudden it's off-centered work, and we've lost our ability to, to, to innovate, I think. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, uh, you mentioned the same thing that's happening in the schools happens within the, the corporate culture as well. Um, isn't a certain amount of that due to fear? Isn't, isn't, as corporations, aren't we afraid of being innovative, that there's a risk to it? I'm gonna come up with some, in, quote, innovative idea, but it may fail. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that if you don't have uh, a system of innovation, principles of innovation, um, a, a rigorous way to decrease the risk of an idea, um, in a systematic way, then it does become daunting. And you think about the folks that are at the very top of an organization, they've got a lot invested in the ideas and, and the, the, the balance sheet, if you will. And of course, they're going to hold on to that. Um, but I think that we are learning through, uh, you know, the Toyotas of the world, the lean startup methodology in the entrepreneurial environment, that there are ways to decrease risk and think very, very uh, lean, lean-like around innovation, carrying out um, very quick, very cheap, uh, very speedy experiments to decrease the kind of risk. The risk comes from spending a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of uh, manpower, building up a fancy uh, solution that falls flat on its, on its face because you haven't done the kind of homework that it takes to get out into the real world and do minimally viable tests to see if there's merit to the idea in the first place. You know, Matt, I, I, we love your website here, and, and it, certainly it's one that always catches our eye, your company, Edit Innovation. We're all editors here in one yep. level or another. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we like that idea. And you, you say that you believe that the biggest opportunities for innovation can be realized by simplifying authorings and streamlining processes. And I think that you define that really through kind of the art and discipline of subtraction. So how do you define that? What, is, what does that mean? What does that, that, that whole idea of editing mean to you? Well, uh, you're right. Uh, editing and subtraction are, are sort of what I'm all about. And um, the notion of subtraction caught my eye, not just through the very, you know, the, the eight years of, of very hard work I had with, uh, with Toyota, where it was a lean environment, where we were constantly trying to maximize effect with minimum means. Uh, but what really caught my eye was a little book called The Laws of Simplicity. 
uh, back in 2006 when my first book came out and when I saw it by John Mida, who at the time was at the MIT Media Lab, um, I thought, wow, that's the book I've always wanted to write. He just sort of has this Zen master way of, of simplifying things, a hundred page book. And the tenth law of simplicity really, really hung with me. It, it is, um, simplicity is about subtracting the obvious to make room for the meaningful. And that's really it in a nutshell. We are not uh, in any in any way do we have a shortage of ideas. Most of them are big, bloated, and too complex. Um, certainly, we don't have the, uh, any shortage of complexity in the world, of noise in the world. But what we are lacking is uh, a good signal to noise ratio. So, how do you stand out and stay relevant in a world that's very noisy and very dis? disruptive and distractive, I think it's through a subtractive process. We are trying to remove anything that is excessive or wasteful or, or confusing or, or hazardous or hard to use, even ugly, um, to make room for things that, uh, that are more valuable and value adding. And, well, or it's restraint to stop adding those kinds of things in the first place. Real, real quick, can you give us uh, an example of what you're talking about? Sure. I guess the one that uh, springs to mind, I think, is the one that my 11-year-old daughter employs every single day, Instagram. Um, when Instagram first started, it was not called Instagram. It was called Bourbon, uh, B-U-R-B-N. -B and it was uh, sort of a big bloated app that tried to take the Photoshop uh, kinds of capabilities and squeeze them into a mobile app. And no one used it. And it wasn't until the founders of, of Bourbon decided to step back, strip out everything but a couple very, very simple features that made it um, just, just intuitively easy for anyone to snap a picture, add a flourish, and send it around the world. And gosh, in the first four months of, of Instagram's uh, launch, they, their growth rate was, was four times that of Twitter and Facebook in, when they launched in those first four months. So, so that's, that's a quick by streamlining. Of, of, of streamlining and simplifying. Okay, well, Matthew May, founder of Edit Innovation, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you want more information on uh, Matt and uh, Edit Innovation, if you, you can just follow the link bef below the player page there. That will take you right out to his website. Matt, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you soon. Okay, so long. Great, great talking to you, Matt. You know, hey, I, I think that's one thing that we all, we all like here is innovation. I think that we look at that and we understand. I think a lot of our readers out there, understand, viewers out there, understand that innovation is, is really, in many ways, it's the key to quality. Right. Uh, you know, quality can be, can be seen as a reactive occupation, but really you want to be proactive. And to be proactive, you've got to be innovative and you've got to look at those things. And I, I, like, I like what he says about, uh, about subtraction is, yeah. you know, you've got to get rid of the, you've got to identify, one of the things we know as editors is yeah. you've got to be willing yeah. to chop. Yes. And it's, that's a hard thing to learn because a lot of times the stuff you chop, it's not that it's bad, it's just superfluous to yes. what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So you've got to get rid of it. Right. And I love that idea. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's really pretty and, 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 and applied to innovation. It makes a lot of sense. It does. And Instagram's a great example, really. Yeah. I think of, and I didn't really actually know that story of Instagram yeah. with bourbon, but uh, I think that it's a great example of, of what that's all about. So yep. good stuff there. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Derek, for conducting that great interview. Well, we have another one for you, another good interview for right. you coming up here. Our next guest on the show has a lengthy list of career accomplishments, not the least of which is that he's been a Quality Digest Daily contributor for several years now. A popular contributor. Very, very say. popular yeah. with all of you out there. Mike Micklewright is a well-regarded author, speaker, and trainer of lean quality management systems and continuous improvement cultures. His teachings underscore the lasting wisdom found in the principles of the late, great W. Edwards Deming. This coming Thursday, March 6th, Mike will join our very own Dr. Shorm right here yeah. in a webinar that will demonstrate how to sustain lean improvement and add spark to your quality management system all at the same time. Mike's latest article, A Holistic Approach to Lean, appeared in Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. So, without further ado, I am very happy now to welcome Mike Micklewright to the show. Hello, Mike. Hello, Mike. Hi, Doug. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Well, he's, he's the guy, but you know, <laughs> we're, we're the guys. He's the guy. <laughs> How are you, Mike? Good to see you today. Thank you. Doing fine, thanks. Good, good. All right, well, let's start off and, and chat a little bit about your most recent article, which really, is, as I mentioned, is about approaching lean holistically. And, and that means to me, and I know it means to you, uh, a focus on principles first and tools second, but it seems that people just want to dive right in with the tools all the time. Why do you think that is? Huh. 
Wow. Uh, many reasons, I suppose. Um, number one, the uh, tools are easy. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's quite easy to, uh, to read about uh, a tool, like uh, let's, say, let's pick the easy one, the fun one, 5S, and it's got five steps. And um, it's easy to implement, it's easy to understand. Um, actually, I should say that it's easy to implement. It seems like it's easy to implement, uh, but it's not implemented very well oftentimes. But the idea is that, yeah, it seems like the right thing to do. It seems like it's going to be easy. It doesn't challenge me. You know, it doesn't challenge a leader or a manager. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, a tool is something easy to implement where it's not going to really affect who I am as a manager or a leader, and I don't have to ask difficult questions. It's also not going to affect uh, the culture of the company, which is really difficult to change, uh, but must be changed. So the hard things to do are at the higher levels, the, the, the principles, uh, determining the principles, uh, establishing the right culture and the business practices to support those principles. Uh, and, then, and then finally, the, the easy thing to do is the implementation of, of the tools. Uh, and so that tends to be the focus. Um, uh, it also seems like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a quick win. Uh, if someone is trying to make an impression, on the organization, on the, what he or she can do, and bring something in, onto the table, um, they can introduce something like uh, uh, like 5S or TPM and say, "Hey, look at look at look how great this is! You know, we finished this up. We made some improvements, some vast improvements in two months." The problem is, is that it's, it's just not going to sustain itself without the right culture to allow for sustainability, and without the organization uh, buying into the, the true principles of the of, of lean. So, Mike, I, I, you know, I think that what, what happens here a lot, it seems to me what happens here a lot, and you wrote about this in your article, is this, this idea of, the, of, of what is the number one killer of, of a process focus, uh, and that's really departmental structures. Uh, is that because, do you think, of like, ter I don't know, territorialism, is it egos, politics, all that kind of stuff, or it, is there something deeper going on there? Uh, territorialism, yes. Egos, yes. Politics, yes. Yes. Something else? Yes. <laughs> yes, all of those. I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a bit of all of that. Um, you know, I think we get comfortable with um, uh, who we are and dealing with our own types of people. Uh, and you get comfortable with just dealing with a certain type of uh, uh, department or organization. So if you're a leader of a department, um, you know, you have, let's say you're a leader of, uh, of an engineering department. You have that engineering mentality. Uh, you were an engineer. Uh, you know how they work, uh, you're, you're specialized, you're comfortable with them, uh, and, uh, and so it makes sense for you to be with them and sit with them and, and, and work with them uh, solely. Uh, and then on the other hand, if you're the manager of a sales group, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, you're comfortable with that department, and, 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 and after a while, too, you also may have built resentment uh, amongst each other, uh, engineering through uh, sales, through customer service, through manufacturing, whatever it might be, there might be those resentments that have built up. And so you do become uh, very territorial um, uh, with regard to uh, your people and your processes. Um, I mean, you know, you think about the reverse and the idea of a, of a sales guy sitting next to an engineer, you know, it just doesn't make sense because uh, they're two different types of people. Uh, you know, engineers like to talk about Star Trek and sales guys <laughs> like to talk about golf. Uh, so uh, it wouldn't make sense to put them near each other. So you get that, that, that feeling and, and that, that uh, um, that sense of territorialism um, to uh, ensure that you know you work together with your people and not with others and also there might be competitive pressures uh, ingrained in the company uh, such as uh, trying to achieve certain objectives or goals within the department and you do so no matter what even to the detriment sometimes of the other departments so we don't look at the entire system uh, you know when I teach root cause analysis it's the exact same thing uh, you know, you, you have to look at the whole process. When you get to the root cause of a problem, uh, the problem may show up in shipping or at the customer, but the root cause may that be back in purchasing or engineering or receiving or wherever. In order to get to the root causes of problems, you have to be able to cross over the boundaries, uh, which are departments. So, you know, if you truly think of, uh, there's a reason why we call them value streams. Uh, uh, they are streams and they should flow. Uh, the impediments or the dams in the streams are the departments. And, and that's what breaks up the flow. And so any organization, if they're truly going to be try, truly, truly be successful in their lean transformation, um, they need to uh, break up those departments. And, and by the way, I'm not the only one that says this. <laughs> there are others. I, you may have, uh, some of you may have read um, a great book uh, that came out somewhat recently, uh, The Lean Turnaround by Art Byrne. And Art Byrne ran uh, uh, Danaher as well as uh, Wiremold for years. And, uh, you know, in his book, 
he says the same things. I mean, he's very radical. He says, you got to break up those departments. you got to break them up. And um, uh, that's hard to do. Um, but you have to break them up and then reorganize as value streams built around processes or product families. Well, Mike, and, and I want to get back to the webinar that, that you and Dirk are going to be doing uh, uh, next week, uh, next Thursday, uh, because really what you're talking about here is, you know, this idea that you have to, you have to break up these, these separations, and you have to establish flow, and, and one of the things you talk about is this idea that, that lean systems and quality management systems really need to function together as one kind of broad-based business management system, and a lot of that really comes about through reducing redundancy. So what, what is that all about? What, what does that mean to you, and what, what should our viewers understand about that? Well, uh, you know, I think one of the important things is to understand that, uh, well, first of all, most people would admit that the hardest part about, about uh, lean is, is sustaining. Uh, you know, again, going back to 5S, the fifth S is sustain. Uh, but really the last S of any lean implementation or lean tool is sustain. And it's so difficult. Um, and so with that, you have to say, okay, we have to look for alternatives uh, to the uh, uh, maintaining that ability to sustain. And, um, and here we have an alternative right within the organization in many organizations. Many companies are certified to an ISO-based standard. Um, and, uh, and those ISO-based standards are about controlling of the operations uh, and the processes within that operation. That's the intent, is to build this standard so that you have controlled conditions throughout the facility, throughout your, all, all of your processes. And so with that in mind, you would say, well, if we live by the spirit of that standard and truly control our processes and so forth, and then we merge that with the lean mindset, the lean mindset, hey, we need to improve, we need to get rid of waste and so forth, and when you get rid of waste, you develop that new standard, okay? So um, now, now you have the standard and you put it into the quality management system or it is part of, just part of the quality management system or as I call it, the business management system. Um, and now you sustain that and you sustain that effort. Um, and so what I'm saying is there's a lot of control systems, really good control systems within a, a decent uh, quality management system that we can use to sustain the gains that we realize through lean improvements. Now a great example of, of merging is, is uh, let's take the quality management system requirement of internal auditing. Uh, we all have to do internal audits, right? Okay, so I would advocate, and, and I've talked to many of my clients, that let's not just teach the normal way of auditing, let's not just teach for auditing for compliance to the standard and procedures, but let's also teach them to search out and seek waste. So as they're observing a process, you not only look for compliance, but you also look for waste. Now you identify the waste, and if the waste is considered to be uh, a large enough waste, then you might decide, well, let's initiate a preventive action. Now most organizations have a difficult time demonstrating proof that they do many preventive actions, and yet if they're a lean organization, they've got plenty of opportunities to show that because so much of lean is about prevention. So anyway, this auditor sees waste, records that uh, in a preventive action, and, uh, and so maybe he saw uh, excessive transportation. You can't record that as a corrective action because there's nothing in the standard that says thou shalt not excessively transport product. So you can't write it as a corrective action, but you can write it as a preventive action because that excessive transportation of product um, could result in lost product, damaged product, uh, contaminated, missing, mixed, whatever. And so it could result potentially in a problem. So we write up a preventive action. Now that preventive action can start up a Kaizen event. Mm -hmm. You see how I'm mixing the words from lean yep. and, and the quality management system? So that starts up a Kaizen event. Uh, the Kaizen event occurs, perhaps new standards, new processes, new leader standard work is developed, and that goes into the quality management or business management system to help sustain the efforts. Yep. So that's one way to mix and blend all of that together. Yep. You know, Mike, I mean, that you, what you're saying, I think you're preaching to, to the choir here. I think that we, we get it. I think that everyone out there should understand this too. If you don't, and if what Mike is telling you is something that you haven't heard before, well, I think we need to encourage you to tune in to the webinar we have coming up next week because we're going to get a lot further into this, you and Dirk, next week, uh, Mike, and talk about all these issues. It's a lot of exciting stuff here that people should know about. So uh, we got to leave it off there. We're, we're out of our time. But thanks again, Mike, for joining us today. Uh, we're going to see you again on Thursday, talk a lot more about this. Uh, again, that's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And Mike, we were going to see you next week then. Thank you.
Thanks again. Talk to you soon. Okay, Mike Nickel Wright. And uh, if you want to, if you're interested in that webinar, yep. there is a link uh, below the player page. Actually, uh, in Mike's article. And in Mike's article. Yeah. Well, there's it's also below the player. In okay. the, below the player page. So you can, well. and, the, and you're going to get a lot of your email next week about that as well. So you can check that right out. Okay. All right. Well, this week's tweet of the week. Mm -hmm. This is a Carl Sagan quote that was tweeted out by the folks at MakerBot. Imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were. But without it, we go nowhere. Ah. Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan. That's right. I, I like that. This good, week's Tweet of the Week. Good words, words to live by. Okay. Well, thank you, Carl Sagan. Thank you, Matthew May. And thank you, Mike Mickelwright, for joining us today. Thank you all for being here as well. And uh, again, don't forget, next week we have that webinar coming up with Mike Mickelwright talking about the business management system idea. Really good stuff there. That's on Thursday, March 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So check that out. Dirk will be hosting that one. And uh, you all have a great weekend. We're going to see you next week uh, for another week of QDD and QDL next week as well. There you go. Thanks. Bye. So long.